Okay, so uh, this is um, just a brief summary of uh, chapter 10.1. Um, chapter 10 is all about hypothesis tests. And along with chapter nine on confidence intervals, these are really the two parts of inference. And inference is kind of the big idea of introductory statistics. So if you think about everything we did in probability, everything we did at the beginning with descriptive statistics, while they're both very cool topics on their own and you can totally learn them for their own uh, usefulness, this idea that inference is really what we want people to get out of statistics and it's the reason why um, people um, take statistics and why, for instance, at Truman, we require the class. So um, as we get started, I want to mention uh, They Might Be Giants has a good uh, video on uh, <clears throat> the scientific method. So um, I recommend you watch that. Um, it seemed weird to put it into a video since it's itself a video. So I have um, a link <clears throat> in the uh, thing on Blackboard, but you can figure it out. But anyway, this idea of hypothesis test can be summarized um, in our textbook. This is page 430 in our textbook that I know you read every day. Um, but the idea is hypothesis testing is very closely tied to the broader idea of the scientific method. So what that is, is you make a claim, you go out and you collect data, then you analyze it to see if that data supports your claim or it doesn't. And what's sort of interesting in what becomes important in statistics is the idea that we never prove a claim. So what you do is you fail to refute the claim. So when we think about the scientific method more generally, right, there was Ptolemy's idea about how the planets went around the solar system, all those kind of good things. And those were great. But when uh, Newton came along and Copernicus came along with modern ideas of physics and said, hey, maybe the sun is in the middle and uh, Galileo and all those guys. And they said, the sun is in the middle and the planets go around it the data that you collected of how the stars, how the planets actually moved in the sky made way more sense with the sun in the middle. And so that refuted the old Ptolemaean model, the idea that the earth was in the middle and the sun went around the earth along with the other planets. And so um, the same is true as we think about lots of other stories as well. You make a claim, then you get evidence and either the evidence says, oh, that claim is wrong or the evidence says, well, maybe that claim is okay. And again, we never prove um, most of our hypotheses. Instead, what we would do is we reject um, bad ideas. And that's really what chapter 10 is going to really be focusing on. So, um, oops, I'm on the wrong screen. Oops. All right. So here again are Dr. Uh, Shan Chan Love's uh, slides, which are great, and I'm totally stealing them. All right. So we talked about confidence intervals more broadly in chapter 9. And the idea there was, if our data looks like this, what's a plausible range that we think the true mean might live in? Hypothesis testing does that in reverse. And what it says is, we have a claim about where we think the true mean might be, or the standard deviation, or the slope, or lots of things. But we have a true, or I'm sorry, we have a claim about where we think the true value might be. And then we get data, and either the data says, yeah, maybe, or no, you're totally wrong, and you should think about something else. So for instance, here is a good example that she puts in here. So a small company had an average purchase per shopper of $50. A random sample of 100 customers this year found that the shoppers spent an average of $55. Suppose that we know that the population center deviation is about $15 both last year and this year. So do we have enough reason to think that the average amount purchased per shopper has increased this year? So 50 is a little bit more than uh, I'm sorry, 55 is a little bit more than 50, but is it enough that we really think there was a change? Or is that just what random, uh, you know, kind of variation uh, might be? And so I'll show you her formula here in a minute, but I want to show you just how we can do it in uh, StatCrunch. So we just go to Stat and we go to T and um, we're going to have a summary data. So um, our sample mean was 55 with a standard deviation of 15, I'm supposed to remember that, and a sample size of 100. And her hypothesis was that it was 50. And I'm going to make a little p-value plot here. Um, and the idea is if we do that difference, it's going to go ahead and calculate that for us. And <clears throat> what it says is that our sample mean was 50. Our standard error, which was 15 divided by square root of 100, so that's 1.5, 
99 degrees of freedom, because remember degrees of freedom is n minus one, gives us a t statistic of 3.333. And you remember for 95% confidence, the t score was about two, a little bit bigger than that. So a t score of three is quite big. And that gives us a p value of 0 0.0012. And so what that says is, if our null hypothesis really were true, and the second set of data came from a population with mean 50, then 1.1% of the time, we would get data that looks like this. And if we look on our little chart here, it would fall over here. So is it impossible that it came from the same data we had before? I guess, but it seems pretty unlikely because you expect the data, right? If, if, the, if it was the same, you know, maybe somewhere over here would be reasonable, but to be way over here is pretty unlikely. And so what we're gonna do is kind of statistically think about how different the data can be from our claim before we really start to think that our claim is wrong. And that's what we're gonna be doing here. And so again, here she is doing the algebra for us. Um, so the idea that the mean was 50, the standard deviation was 15, the distribution isn't known, but because it's 100, we can assume it's approximately normal. And our expected value is $50, and our sample error is 1.5, right? Again, 15 divided by square root of 100. And um, as we do that, she calculates it through, and she gets a p-value of 0 0.0004. So what that says is there's four hundredths of a percent chance that you would get data like this if our claim was true. Because that small probability is so tiny, 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 we would probably conclude that there is in fact a change. So to say, eh, it's random chance, $5 is that much more. Well, given the data that we have, that's actually a pretty big change and enough that we would think, oh, something's going on here, um, which makes us say um, that our assumption is incorrect. Okay, so that's what we're gonna be doing. And here we are, we'll get into more of the detail of that. All right, so in 10.2, we'll get into the actual formula stuff. Right now, we're just going to talk about kind of the language of it. So this general process is called hypothesis testing. And the idea is, again, we're going to have a claim, which is assumed to be true. That's the null hypothesis. And then the alternate hypothesis is that the null hypothesis is wrong. And we often call this h naught and she spells it H naught, but it's actually not N-A-U-G-H-T because it was made by British people because um, that's a word for zero. Or the alternative hypothesis, which we call H1, some books call it H-A for alternate, um, that, excuse me, that we're trying to find um, that it might not be true. So um, people use the analysis, analogy of the criminal justice system, which is the idea that, um, innocent and still proven guilty. So we assume the person's innocent and then we start piling up evidence. And if, if enough evidence piles up, this assumption of innocent looks like it's not true. And that's how someone gets convicted, right? Once we've uh, refuted all of the reasonable doubts so that there is no reasonable doubt left, then uh, a person can be convicted of a crime. And I've actually been on a couple of juries and I'll tell you that's pretty much how it works. Um, notationally, we always frame things in terms of the parameter. So that means we use the Greek letter, not the X bar. So we use mu or whatever. The null hypothesis always, always, always has an equal sign in it. So that is we assume it's equal. Now it can be equal or greater or equal or less than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, or straight equals. But the alternative hypothesis never, ever, ever has an equal sign in it. I can say that again. The only time an alternative hypothesis has an equal sign in it is never. So it can be of three shapes. It can be not equal to, which means we don't care which side it is. So again, if we look at our uh, little chart from before, that was uh, looking at it both sides because it gave you the, the things on both sides. Or it can be just one side to the left or one side to the right. That depends on your story, right? That's not a math decision. That's a story question. Do we think we only care if it's bigger in one direction or are we interested in a difference in either direction? So for instance, in the vaccine trials, what you would do is you would compare our new vaccine to a placebo or to the old one. And what you would say is, right, that the new one has to be strictly greater than the old one in order for us to do that. However, if the new vaccine is strictly worse, that's not a win. And in fact, we should probably stop 
testing that new vaccine as we do that. Okay, so <clears throat> she writes here some of the wrong ways to do it, right? We don't put X bar in. We have to make sure these are the same number in both cases. And you have to make sure to put your mu in here. Okay, and again, it always has the true value, the mu or the p, not the x bar or the p hat that you get. All right, so here are some examples. Um, so the pizza delivery company says, on average, it takes us 30 minutes to deliver a pizza. Us old people remember when Domino's used to actually say, if we don't deliver it in 30 minutes, it's free. So we can set that up that mu equals 30. That's our null hypothesis, or mu is greater than 30. Okay, um, four out of five dentists recommend sugar-free gum. You believe it's less than that. Um, and so you're gonna use a less than hypothesis um, for the null hypothesis. And again, the null hypothesis is the true proportion, P is equal to 0.8. The alternate is that it's less than 0.8. The diet one, again, if you take a new diet plan and it makes you uh, gain weight, that's not a good diet plan. So it's going to be a one-sided hypothesis. Now, it's a little bit funny because this question is framed in terms of losing weight. So if you lose weight, that's actually greater than a certain amount, even though it's a negative number. So you could do it either way, but um, it depends how you explain it. But the idea is that weight loss in pounds is zero, means it doesn't add or lose weight, and it doesn't. Uh, the alternate is that you do lose weight. So the weight loss is positive. And again, that's not a problem with statistics. That's a problem with English, right? Words are weird. Okay. Once we get our data back, the language is still very important and very precise. We either say that we reject an all hypothesis or we didn't do that. So we either would say our data supports um, the claim about um, the sales at the company or it didn't. In our case, it didn't. So we would say we, re we rejected the null hypothesis that sales were 50. It was in fact higher than that. Okay, and we'll learn more precise ways to do that. Last thing um, in chapter 10.1, again, 10.2, we'll get into the actual calculation for means. 10.3 does proportions. You'll be not surprised to learn. And the idea is um, you can make this little truth table and say, gosh, is my data true or false? And what are we going to do about it? So the truth, right, really real, real reality is that either the null hypothesis is true or the alternate hypothesis is true or the null hypothesis is false. And one of those is true. And then we have our data over here on the side. So either we reject the null hypothesis or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So in general, what we typically have, because you do a research because you think there's something different, is that we plan to reject the null hypothesis and we hope our data supports it. So the new vaccine works better than a placebo, right? If that's good, then the data is gonna back it up and it's gonna really be true. In a court case, you would say, the evidence supports the person, the, I'm sorry, the evidence refutes the claim of innocence. It causes us to reject. We have rejected all reasonable doubts and the person goes to jail. If we don't have enough evidence, or the evidence points in the other direction, then we would like to not reject the null hypothesis. If there's not enough evidence, the person doesn't go to jail, and we'd like it to be that the person didn't actually commit the crime. Both of these are good, right? I, when I draw this on a chalkboard, there's a little smiley face there, and I didn't care enough to edit her slides to put a little smiley face in there. But the idea is, if the person's guilty, we want them to go to jail. If they're not guilty, we want them to uh, go free. Right? And even that language of guilty or not guilty, that's different than innocent. We didn't prove somebody innocent, we just failed to prove the person was guilty. Now, because that's the right answer, there are two different kinds of wrong answers. There's the wrong answer that we call type one error, which is where the null hypothesis is true, but we reject it. So in the court case, again, this is the one the whole legal system is designed to stop, which is that an innocent person goes to jail. Right? The reason we have all those protections in court is because we think innocent people shouldn't go to jail. Similarly, if the new uh, vaccine is not better than a placebo, we would like to not find that. And if we did, just because the random chance, you know, we just happen to get lucky 
that that particular time the placebo gave us cases where the person didn't get uh, didn't uh, get sick or they got healthy faster or whatever. Um, that's the type one error. Type two error is the opposite. Type two error is where a guilty person does not go to jail. It's where the new vaccine works, but we can't prove it. In some ways, type one error is the most dangerous, but type two error is the very frustrating one. And again, the idea that the innocent person goes free, um, you know, Lex Luthor doesn't go to jail, or we found this really awesome new drug, but our data doesn't back it up. Could it be that a second trial would show that it does? Maybe, but typically we only do one trial. Could it be that a second trial convicts the person? Maybe, but we don't do trials twice. That's part of the legal process. So like I said, type one and type two errors are just these things. So we often call type one error, the probability of it is alpha, and the probability of type two error is beta. Typically we think about beta as more a thing we don't have. So sometimes we call beta the lack of power because we weren't able to find the thing that we know is true. Um, okay, alpha is the probability of a type one error. Um, and that's gonna be um, kind of an important thing. All right, the last slide here is, uh, we wanted to see uh, an example. So the dean of a business school wants to see whether the mean salary is greater than $50,000. So if the mean is $50,000 or less, and the dean rejects an all hypothesis, is that right or wrong? And is it a type one or type two error? And the answer is it's a type one error because we rejected an all hypothesis, but we really shouldn't have. Okay. And so um, you can read these other two examples, but if the true mean is higher, but we reject it, that's good. And so we found the difference that was really there. And then the last one is, there is a difference, but we fail to find it. And that's gonna be a type two error. Okay, so type one and type two, I mean, they're just vocabulary words and they're kind of things that are easy to mess up. But the idea that type two is lack of power and type one is um, a false positive reading, right? And again, if you think about vaccines, um, or even you think about maybe a COVID test, since that's in the news these days, right? Some tests are designed to have uh, very few false positives and more false negatives. The idea being that you can go have a second test. And in fact, those very quick tests that aren't uh, as expensive, they're normally calibrated to have false positives because the idea is if you test positive, you'll go and have a second test. That's much more accurate. False negatives are in some ways worse because then a person who actually does have the communicable disease is out walking around because we weren't able to detect the test. So false positives are type one error, false negatives are type two. And again, depending on your story, um, that could be, um, you know, one could be a bigger deal than the other. So um, that's chapter 10.1. 10.2 will get us into actually looking at hypotheses.